So no matter where you are in the world, if you're someone who's interested in space, then it does not get any bigger than this. Now, Eric, India is aiming to be the fourth nation, just the fourth nation in the world for a soft landing on the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. 1972 was the hallmark for the United States. Now it's India's time. And I think and I believe that uh, uh, now it's a big feat, not only, like I said, for India, but for the whole world. Because Absolutely. space enthusiasts will be looking at the soft landing, what we are calling the soft landing of the Chandrayaan-3 uh, spacecraft yep. to, to the lunar surface. And we'll be telling you why it is important for ISRO to land this uh, spacecraft in the south pole of the moon, because that's where they're saying there's a lot of water Absolutely. and life. You never that's, know. That's very, very crucial. And to tell us as to why, you know, we are counting down to the last few minutes and we're being joined by Dr. Amitabh Ghosh, who's joining us live from Washington, D.C. He's a space scientist at NASA. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, this, this is a big moment, not just for India and indeed for the rest of the world as well. Now, India is hoping to become the first nation to attempt a soft landing on the moon. India will be the fourth nation after the United States, China and the former Soviet Union to attempt a soft landing. But just in the final few moments, tell us what challenges await India now. Right. So let me just, um, I, I, I couldn't just um, hear the first part of your sentence. Um, India is the fourth country. Correct. Uh, you mentioned first, I think. No, no, my I think apologies. The, India, India maybe is indeed the fourth. India is the fourth nation after the United right. States, China and the Soviet right. Union. Right, right, right. The first maybe to attempt one at the South Pole. So, so yes, it is a very big deal. Um, see, we don't realize it, but there are 200 countries and just three of them have, have this capability. So what is more important is not just this mission, but the development of this capability to soft land on another heavenly body. Mm -hmm. So if you recall, you know, in the 1900s, India did not have the capability to send an orbiter around any heavenly body, right? And then there was Chandrayaan. And then once Chandrayaan happened, uh, India did Mangalyaan, and now the stock of then there was Chandrayaan two, and then there's going to be Mangalyaan two possibly in the future. So it develops a huge, it develops a platform. It almost you're developing a platform where you can do many many more things. So it's it's a very big thing, and um, from the world perspective, um, uh, um, it, it's a diff it, it's a, it's a um, um, you know uh, America and Russia went to the moon 50 years back. Right. Um, but but there is a renewed interest in the in the moon uh, i think um the world has uh, the, the space agencies have, have uh, you know uh, decided that kind of mars is too far away for human right. missions for the immediate present Dr. So now, Tom, let me um, just get in here and uh, just uh, talk about the uh, essence of this uh, exploration we are looking at uh, the uh, spacecraft landing at the south pole of the moon. We just want to know what are the challenges that, uh, and uh, my colleague Sale was asking that, what are the challenges that maybe this spacecraft may be facing uh, before it makes this soft landing that we are keenly awaiting for? Uh, so there are many things, there are many parameters here. So there are different stages to the landing. Each stage has to start at the right time and end at the right time. The ground detection has to be correct so you you're trying to not just slow the velocity you're trying to slow the velocity at the right altitude so if you slow it down further away from the ground then you're going to accelerate again because of lunar gravity mm -hmm. uh, if you misestimate and you think that the ground is here right. and the ground was actually here then you're going to hit the ground uh, hit, hit the ground at a very high speed see the challenge here is imagine if you had a, a box full of electronics in a briefcase mm -hmm. and you're dropping dropping it from the building um if it hits the ground beyond a certain speed all your electronics will be destroyed absolutely so if you if you hit it at 100 miles an hour it will be all destroyed but you know uh, it's actually not bad this, this whole thing is probably um, um um traveling a few minutes back at 5,000 miles or 3,000 miles an hour so decelerating it from that high speed to 100 miles is not that bad but again, it's not good enough because it will still be destroyed if it is, uh, if it hits at 100 miles per hour. So there, obviously, ISTRO has done its multiple tests, but you know, um, being 
being worked on many NASA missions and being involved in many NASA missions, I, I have also seen the share of fa failures, and it happens to every space agency. It happened to NASA. I, I was just talking about um, to another um, channel, uh, mm -hmm. the UK mission Beagle in 2004 right. uh, crashed eight days before our mission. Um, I think around 25th December 2003. Right. So it was completely heartbreaking, you know. Okay. So th things happen, right? So, but but you know, I would assume that this uh, chairman has um, put out repeated statements, and they have done an incredible job in engineering, and everything Absolutely. would be fine. Okay, we are looking at the time now, and it's uh, almost uh, less than 30 minutes before the soft landing. Uh, the soft landing be uh, begins um, on the moon. This is a big feat for India. It's a celebrating moment. It's a feat for India. It's a feat for the world. And we also had uh, presidents congratulating the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, and saying that, oh, you know, India has made a great feat and a great challenge, um, you know, to explore the space, to explore the moon so this soft landing will be vi very vital and very crucial not only for india but also for space enthusiasts dr amitab i just want to know from you what makes this uh, south pole and areas near the south pole so attractive for exploration so imagine you're traveling from um i don't know south africa to mm -hmm. america and um there was no water available in America. So what do you have to do? You have to take gallons of water with you for, say, you're staying 30 days. Uh, you take 30 gallons or 80 gallons of water. So what will happen to the cost of the trip? It will just shoot to the roof. You'll have to take everything else. So the reason uh, human beings were able to settle in America because you could live off the land. Right. So here also, um, if you go to the moon and you have to carry everything from Earth, the economics wouldn't work. So what we call is in situ resource utilization. You have to learn how to live off the land. So the most interesting thing here is that there are some um, low-lying craters here which are permanently in shade. Um, and so the sunlight doesn't reach there because the sunlight on the moon is much more severe. Because remember, there's no atmosphere and the temperatures are much hotter. So it is possible those ice deposits in those craters have survived. Right. So now, can you get to those ice deposits? Can you extract the ice in a cost-effective way and a viable engineering uh, method? Then it becomes interesting for future human missions. So astronauts could presumably go there, use that water, extract oxygen from it, and also generate rocket fuel from it. So it's a long way from there. But at the first step, um, I guess the thought is to, can you map out where the extent of the water deposits okay. uh, and, um, uh, and the amount, the composition? The first, these are the first questions. Absolutely indeed. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, just one quick question to you. You know, uh, the fact that water exists on the moon was something that was established in the first Chandrayaan mission in Chandrayaan 1 way back in 2008-2009. Now, a lot of people would be interested in knowing in what form will water be found on the moon surface, especially on the south pole of the moon. Because what is in fact being said is that there are these craters on the southern pole of the moon where sunlight hasn't been able to penetrate for billions of years. So the temperatures could be as low as minus 200 Kelvin. Um, this, this is something that a lot of people would find fascinating. In what form are we likely to find water there? See, it will be ice, right? I mean, it will be ice. It may be a structurally or crystal, crystalline, uh, in a crystalline fashion, if you're thinking uh, fundamental chemistry, it might be a slightly different form. But compositionally, it will be ice. If you, um, if you think of Antarctic ice, um, that's also very, very old. The Antarctic ice cores that come out at 10,000, 100,000 years old. So here also, it will be very old. Um, I'm not sure about the billion year um uh, time frame but um it will be very old and you have but chemically so long it is ice then and if you can heat it um and make it water then it is still very useful but as i said the cautionary tale is see we made oxygen on mars uh, right. for perseverance so that's a technology demonstration step here also you know if it is found then you have to actually show it is viable it's just not simply that you know, as you said, it's it's at a brutal, brutally cold temperature. Right, it's yeah. not your refrigerator, right? It's right. 
So it is a, you have to heat it and then you, you have to have a viable method. And then remember, heating, that also requires energy. Where are you going to get the energy from? The solar energy is not that, that um, you know, mm -hmm. may not be that much, right? So all these right. have to be figured out. But but Absolutely. the long-term view, the, it's the same reason why Mars is exciting because below the regolith, you're seeing some, um, some hints of water. And the Chinese rover, Mars rover, uh, NASA rover, everybody is looking into that. So so it's a very interesting frontier in planetary explosion. When we started this business, we thought the moon was dry. After Apollo 11, we thought the moon was dry. Right? Absolutely. So it's a fascinating place to be. Absolutely. This is indeed such a fascinating mission, Eric. Uh, because, you know, at this point of time, we, we're just counting down to those last few moments mm -hmm. before uh, Vikram lander, in fact, begins that very difficult descent. We are at 17.44 hours, 5.44 p.m. Mm -hmm. This is the moment when Vikram Lander will, of course, begin that difficult journey of us slowing down and, and then descending further to the surface of the moon. The next 20 minutes are extremely critical. The next 20 minutes are extremely critical for the country and for the world and for space enthusiasts, indeed. If the Vikram Lander does make a soft landing on the moon, this will make a crucial step to space enthusiasts and maybe you never know in the next coming years right. we'll be having humans landing again on the moon now let's go live to Bengaluru where we are observing or the delegates are observing the final moments or the final minutes of this landing our correspondent, our senior correspondent, Siddharth MP, is live in Bengaluru, where this observation is currently happening. Siddharth MP, good to see you. Maybe you can start by telling us what's the mood there. So, Eric, uh, the process has started. This is what is known as the 19 minutes of terror. This is the process that everyone has been waiting for for the last 40 days and the milestone is barely 19 or 18 minutes away as we speak. So the mood here, of course, high anxiety, high blood pressure, high heart rates for everyone. Despite the confidence that the scientists have in this mission, for everyone who's built it, this is, of course, anxiety. There is, um, you know, uh, visible tension on their faces. At the same time, let's also keep in mind that that's the nature of their job because um, they work so hard for it because a space mission, as we see, is barely 40 days, right? From the time to uh, time of launch till the time of landing, it's 40 days. But for them, it's the last four years. Chandrayaan 2 failed in 2019, September. So here we are in August 2023. Over the last four years, they worked on this mission. And uh, what is, you know, puzzling and funny about space science is that if you, for example, buy a supercar right. and if there is a problem with the supercar, the company calls it back and says, OK, we'll replace the parts for you. In space, none of that is possible. It has to be 100 percent flawless. It has to be 100 percent error free. It's so complicated that after you launch, whatever, uh, you know, changes have to be made. Only at the software level, it Absolutely. can be changed. The hardware cannot be replaced. So that's the level of complexity.